and copies. We're going to define some terms tonight, and uh, as I was saying in the beginning, I'm, I'm, I'm reading the material, I'm uh, processing the material, I'm reducing the material down to a series of about, I want to say, 10 lessons. So you're, you're at lesson number eight. You had a test at lesson number five. We'll probably have another test at lesson number 10. If there is another lesson, I have, to, I have to really be impressed by the material I've read. I've read a number of chapters ahead. Not only read the book a number of times, but I'm trying to condense down, listen to the Lord a little bit, and get on this so we can get past it and move on to something else. But I really believe that this is very important. Structure, messages, structure of messages, that sort of thing. So we'll continue on for at least two more lessons after eight, nine, and ten, the way it looks. Then there'll be that last little test. Now you know how I do tests. You could get an all true and false test, something. It's, it's, not, it's not about holding your feet to the fire. It's, um, it's just a, a, it's a, it's a, an awakening to that I, I was here, I did the material, I, I understand it, I got this, and uh, then, then we'll move on. Uh, but here tonight, my verse for the lesson tonight, and for lesson number eight, and we're going to define terms. I guess if I was going to call it anything, uh, it'd be the definition of the discussion. Um, and I wrote that in room number number one, but I didn't put it at the top of the page, which I probably should have. But I want to start with 2 Timothy 4.17. So in your Bible or in your syllabus, I have it turned here in my scriptures, but in the syllabus, I've also copied and pasted it. So it says, Notwithstanding the Lord stood with me, this is Paul talking to Timothy, and strengthened me, that by me the preaching, and that's, I'm emphasizing the word preaching th this evening, might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So Paul put a premium on preaching and uh, when you study hermeneutics or, or the definition of terms in the, in the light of the Scripture, then preaching is held to the context of Scripture, uh, holy things, godly things, not worldly things. I used to make the open air thing at U University of Cincinnati, and you had uh, one hour every day free time. I don't know if they still do that. Years ago, you were allowed to go down. You are allowed to debate. You were allowed to do anything you wanted to do. And no matter what you were doing, you weren't with our group. They called you pre. They said you were preaching. Well, they were. They weren't preaching the word of God. They were preaching Darwinism, something like that. And we'd have time. We'd go down there and preach. You know, creation. <laughs> anyway, preaching in the context here, Paul put a premium on preaching. Might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. He was the apostle to the Gentiles, why it's Gentile, while Timothy was in Ephesus. It was a city of Gentiles, so on and so forth. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The lion be here, all the forces of evil, so on. If we're to expound the verse, just a little, give you a little background. Uh, the devil is a roaring lion seeking whom he, going about seeking whom he may devour. So that's the reference Paul's making. And, but it was through the preaching that the, by me, the preaching might be fully known. So... People know things, Bible things, scriptural things through preaching. So preaching is very important. The other verse is Titus 1, 3, and I've got it copied and pasted for you. But hath in due times manifest his word. Watch now. We want to be able to manifest his word through preaching. And I want you to notice the Holy Spirit has put the word preaching in there. He didn't say talking. He didn't say joking. He didn't say talking. Whatever you put, anything you want, he put the word preaching in there. And remember, we defined the word preach. Somebody said, well, what is preaching? It's a good question. And the best scripture that I can give you is Isaiah chapter 58, verse, verse 1. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and cry aloud. He was proclaiming. It's a proclaiming, preaching. And in this case, the word of God. So I'm skeptical when somebody gets up and say, well, this guy's going to bring the message this morning. He gets up and, well, it's good to see you today. We're really going to have a good time in the Lord today. You know, God is so good. And I'm going to... And he never lifts his voice beyond a whisper. And, you're... and he never takes a text, but he tells you 15 stories 
about whatever and then says, oh, yeah, by the way, Jesus is good. He saved my soul. And would somebody help me with the invitation? He's totally aloof. He's, he's not there. Say, what is that? It's not preaching, okay? Now, preaching doesn't have to be done. There are styles. I want to talk about styles, but not tonight. There are styles of preaching in the parks country. You get down in North, South Carolina, they, they, they preach. They preach. <laughs> get up in the north and and they don't, it's more of a lecture type, but they're still going to stand, lift up their voice, and they're going to make some sense. And I want to talk about the definition of the term. So Titus says here, Paul tells Titus, but hath in due times manifest his word through preaching. So it's through preaching, not, not talking through the preaching of the word of God. And now don't get it confused with teaching. I'm trying to teach. Very hard for me to teach because first off, I'm a preacher and I don't discipline myself to hold to the mode of teaching. This morning, I was a little, I felt a lot better. No, I'm just kidding. I, but, um, you know, I, I, I believe that the Lord directs you. I did not have in my Sunday school lesson a graphic, but I was going down the route and trying to expound that one verse of Scripture that Paul had a testimony and it turned into more of a message. But you got to be careful. I have to be careful because people say, what's he doing, preaching or teaching? Well, it's tough sometimes. So teaching um, might be more, more of the monotone. Where preaching, you lift up your voice, if I could give you a very generic uh, idea. So those two verses, uh, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Then I want to go on, definition of the text. What is the text? When a preacher says, okay, I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to such and such a place. And we call that his text. That's his text. So in the syllabus I've written here, the word text is derived from the Latin Texas, um, textus, uh, which means something woven. Um, the textile industry uh, uses the word textile because it's woven fabrics or woven cloth. So to, the text comes from that word. For instance, see the word texture. It denotes, therefore, the web of the discourse. Now, these are definitions that um, are, are just uh, current to what we're, we're teaching here we speak of the text of scripture by this we mean all the words of holy right thus any part of the bible selected for exposition is called the text so you'll hear us refer to our text let me take my text tonight you say what is that should i have a text if i'm going to deliver a message or if i'm going to preach or even if i'm going to teach in the in the def, in the in the in the in the realm of scripture and scriptural things, godly things, church things, and we're in that context, if you were going to teach, then you would probably need a text. So you'll be teaching someplace from the scriptures. And we'll give some reasons for the text. But that's the definition for the text. Now, the definition for the theme. Remember, we told you there were three or four parts to the message as we um, taught last week. Uh, I don't know what's the best way to do this. One, two, three, four, I don't know, uh, text. Uh, you know, might take up that part right there. And then uh, I think we, let's see what all we got here. I think I put it on the last page. Uh, well, I put uh, proposition, explanation, observation, illustration. Probably if you have last week's, I probably put it at the last two. It was text, introduction, theme, something like that discussion conclusion and so these are the parts um, parts of or to the message or we might say sermon and I probably can not wouldn't have to write I think you're you're catching what I'm trying to say especially with it copied and pasted. It's the definition of the theme. By this is meant that part of the sermon which defines the main truth to be expounded from the text. 
In other words, if you take a text, you're going, to, you're going to try to do something with that text or bring something out of that text to those that hear. As we ver- our springboard verses where the, he, he took the preaching that they might hear, that the Gentiles might hear. So we want to make sure we understand this. Uh, the theme is, therefore, the most striking truth contained in the text, not necessarily the whole subject matter of the text. It is a concise statement of the principal truth which the preacher sees in this or his text and which he proposes to expound in his sermon. The theme is the discourse con- condensed. So we want to know that the thing has a theme. And you may hear me say, I'm going to take my text tonight, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 through verse 16. Now I'm very careful not to take a long text because it takes time to read all that text. I'm very, unless I just feel like I'm very impressed, and I'll, a lot of my sermons will have two text readings, the long text or the abbreviated text. Now, I don't tell you that, but I do that. You say, why? Because a lot of times people are there with you. They, when you say Romans chapter 1, they say, oh, Romans chapter 1. Paul wrote the book of Romans to the Romans in Romans chapter 1. Ain't that the chapter where he talks about the reprobate mind and those who didn't want to retain God their own knowledge? I wonder what he's going to say about this tonight. And a lot of people get it, but then a lot of people don't, and they don't have a clue what's in Romans chapter 1. And if that's the case, I may read the whole chapter. Now, if I read the whole chapter... I worry about attention span of the people. So be very careful with your text. Time, you'll have so much time. Somebody say, you need to put together a 10-minute message. You're not going to be able to read the whole 119th Psalm, 10 minutes. It's the longest chapter in the Bible. Got it, so it makes sense. So you want to shorten your text, but you want to make sure the text contains the theme or what you want to talk about. And we're defining these terms, and I've copied and pasted so that you'll have them. So text is important. Theme is important. The definition of the introduction, then you need an introduction. By this is meant that part of the sermon which leads up to the discussion and thus prepares the audience for the main part of the sermon, the discussion. Now, I'm giving you a well-ordered way to put a message together, especially as people that don't put messages together all the time but want to know how it works and know the mechanics of it and that's what you're getting you're getting the nuts and bolts of how to put a message together and how it should be put together and once if you're going to do this or you think God has called you to preach and you want to get up and preach and let me include in this you can use the same type of format for teaching the word it's very good and um, it gives you the how-to Now, once you know the how-to, it's easy to slide from the text, the reading of the text, to the theme, which sometimes includes the, the title to your message. I'll do that a lot. My theme will be the title of the message. And then I'll have an introduction for the message. And I don't tell you, okay, now here's the theme, here's the, here's the introduction. I don't do all that, but I'm doing that. I have a format to go through this thing. And then I get into the discussion, which is the bigger part of the message, which is text, which is right. Now I'm just going to put an X in it. So, you know, it's the bigger part of the message. That's the discussion, and we will focus primarily on the discussion tonight and how that should be, or that's the meat of the message you want to get across, and lastly, there'll be the last part. So these are the nuts and bolts. You obviously don't get up and say, okay, now we will say, I'm going to take my text tonight, Romans chapter 1, 1 through 3, or something like that, or Romans chapter 1, verse 16, whatever, wherever. It, but you won't tell them, here's my introduction. Now listen real carefully once you get my, you just do it. This is just the how-to. Okay, I know you get that. All right, the definition of the introduction, we got that. The definition of the discussion, which actually my main topic for the night. And uh, Roman numeral chapter 1 it says the definition of the discussion or our topic for the lesson, which is that part of the sermon which presents the truth contained in the text and the theme it is therefore the most important part of the sermon. It is, it is that for which the text theme 
introduction and conclusion exist. The preacher may be likened to a builder and his sermon to the building he wishes to erect in the hearer's mind. For this building, he needs a definite plan. His business in the sermon is to work out his plan to construct the building. A foundation must first be laid and proceeding in an orderly sequence, the preacher builds until the structure is complete. That's just an illustration of how a message is supposed to work. We can also use the illustration if you're going to be an artist. I love painting. I love artwork. And if you're going to be an artist and you want to paint a picture, the first thing you have to have is, a, is well, obviously you've got to have the paints and all that. But you have to have a subject. What am I going to paint? Am I going to paint a landscape? Am I going to paint uh, a still life? What am I going to paint? Am I going to paint portraits? Well, if you're going to paint landscapes, you got to know where to start. You see, a message is the same way. A sermon is the same way. I'm not going to draw no pictures. I get busy drawing. We'll be laughing, carrying on. So. It's the same thing. You, you want to put it together like a builder puts a building together is what, what we're saying. So the definition of the discussion, and it's the most, it, it has divisions. Look at Roman number, number two, divisions in the discussion. Uh, notice in building the threefold division of foundation, uh, superstructure, and roof. Those are the three main components if you're going to build something. You have to have a good foundation. Then you have to have the structure or the framework or the 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 bones of it that holds it together, and then you got to put a roof on it if it's uh, going to be a building. So the discussion must have definite order, and that's the point I would drive home tonight. Or when you're bringing a message, you want some order to that thing. If you just get up and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about peace tonight, and you take your text out of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and you say, well, the Bible says, uh, love, joy, and peace, but I want to stop on the word peace, and then you ramble on about peace, and you talk for 35 minutes on peace, and I mean talk, not preach. You have no order, you have no points, no subpoints. you've done no homework, no illustrations, but you just talk off of whatever comes off the top of your head. That's not a message. That's a mess. And could I say this? There's a whole lot of preachers out there, what we call shooting from the hip. I wish they'd have stayed home. Amen, Brother Phil. That's good preaching. Uh, you say, what is that? That's unprepared. I don't care to know. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And you say, well, that's what's wrong with churches today. There's no structure to what people are saying. So when we come away, we're scratching at what did he say? Did he say what I think he said? Did he say that a dove was going to come uh, with a branch in its mouth and then we would know there was perfect peace? And it doesn't make a lick of sense. And I'm rambling now. But that's how a lot of preaching is. And that's why I'm doing it. That's not preaching. You say, what is that? I can't use the words. <laughs> Definition and the discussion. It's a mess. There we go. So the, here, watch. Notice, and we, we did the building thing. There's divisions. The purpose of the divisions, let me give you these things. Number three, uh, these divisions of the sermon serve the same purpose as the skeleton of the human body. Now, did I, I don't know if I did it. Did I preach the message here that I put together on the church like a body? And I used the skeletal structure, and I talked about the bones, I talked about the muscles, I talked, and I had order, I had divisions in what I was trying to say, the church is a body. And uh, uh, that's, that's the way a message is. It's got to have a skeletal structure, and then you've got to put, or we would say an outline, and then you've got to put some meat on the bones so somebody can get something. You just look at a skeleton, it's very hard to see what kind of person that is. But if you give it some meat and some flesh and bones, or if you're like an artist, you put some color to the thing, all of a sudden it starts making sense. And an artist, he's, he's number one, once he has a subject, let's say we got a landscape and we're going to draw a picture, a message is the same way. We're looking at that thing and we know there's got to be a vanishing point. I'm going to give you a little art lesson here. We know that the painting is broken in thirds. 
just like that. Now those are imaginary lines. You've got, uh, you've got distant, far ground, middle ground, and foreground. Everything back here is real light. Everything right here is middle tone. Everything right here is real dark. And if you don't follow that rule, that principle, your painting will look like mud. And as you sketch, you may sketch that on there first. You may put your sketch in here, and you may put your mountains back here like this, like that. You may draw your road down here like this and get some perspective in here, and there's my road. You may put some trees in here like that. The foreground, they're real big. But all it is is a rough sketch. It needs some color. That's how a message is put together. You get the thing going. Um, that's a mess. And if you don't have... Um, you don't have a system, and that's all we're giving you, a system to develop a message. And it's been tried and true. We've seen it with the Lord's Sermon on the Mount. We've seen it with his other message. Last week we looked at that. So the divisions, and I look at Roman number number three. Three divisions of the sermon serve the same purpose. I'm sorry, these divisions of the sermon serve the same purpose as the skeleton of the human body. The bones are the framework on which the body is built. One may have a skeleton without a body, uh, but hardly a body without a skeleton, unless it be like a jellyfish. And no sermon should resemble this. In his address, the speaker must clothe the skeleton of his outline with the flesh and blood of his own thoughts and words note a threefold purpose of the divisions number one they keep the speaker to his theme so I've chosen a theme and I have the theme up there and I want to keep the people that are out here on the same page with me and so I have to have some divisions in my point number one, point number two. We drew that out for you. won't do it again. Point number three and some sub points under that. And those points, all those are divisions in the discussion. You may have three points. You may have four points. You may have six, seven. There's no rule to that. God works in sevens. A lot of preachers think they got to have seven point message. I don't feel that way. A lot of people think you need a three-point message. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. A lot of verses of Scripture yield themselves to a three-point break. Some yield themselves to a four-point break. Remember when we talked about John? John said, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there were three breaks there. The way, the truth, the life. And that's just an automatic break. Those would be three good points in three distinct levels in that discussion. And you can talk about Jesus as the way. When Jesus says, I'm the way, well, we can discuss there are many ways. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end there are the ways of death. We can just go on and on with all the verses that we know on the way. Point number two, Jesus is the way. He's the truth. And then talk about all the truth. And then the life. He's the life, and that'll give you a good conclusion. So you kind of got an idea and a feel for the breaks in the discussion. Excuse me. I am struggling tonight, but I think pastor had it. It's the flesh. So the points and the divisions in the discussion of the message, the bulk of the message or the, or the message itself, there's some divisions, and they keep the speaker to his theme. Now, not only does the hearer need to feel the continuity of what you're trying to say, but you need to be held. You say, why? Because number one, when you get up to speak, you're going to be afraid. Amen. And have you ever been afraid and tried to do something that you know you know how to do and you can't do it? That's that fear of man. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. Believe me, it does. You'll have all kinds of issues. If you've got to teach, if you've got to speak. So if you have an outline and some order to what you're going to say, and I'm following this thing diligently tonight. Say why? I'm just not with it. <laughs> So I almost handed this to you, said, go read it front and back. We'll do the test next week, but let me talk my way through it. And we'll, I'm not trying to preach tonight. All right. Um, so here divisions prevent him or the man doing the lesson or the lady from wandering into the fields of fantasy. <laughs> if, it's good to have an outline once in a while. It'll keep you as the speaker on track. You don't need to chase rabbits. Just to prove this dog can hunt. 
You've heard that cliche, I'm sure. He says here, uh, keep him out of the fields of fantasy or generalizing by the hour from Genesis to Revelation. A lot of preachers, they'll get on something, and the next thing you know, they have went from Genesis to Revelation, and you've lost track of whatever they're doing or whatever they're saying, and you have no idea what's going on. That's not a well-ordered message. It's not well thought through. It's not prayed over because God is not the author of confusion. Remember that. So you need to be, uh, have it in order. Secondly, they tend to retain the attention of the audience. And I had made that point first. And it does. If you've got some points, people follow along. A lot of people take notes. They'll write down everything you say. And uh, they'll, they'll even ask you. I was asked this morning, what was that other verse you gave? I was trying to pay attention. I was trying to get it. And uh, I was able to give them the verse. And that happens all the time. You say, what is that? Well, I have an order to what I try to say. And they'll have the points all written down. They'll have them. Jeremiah preached a message Wednesday night, a wonderful message. I think I got almost all the points to that thing. <laughs> and I wrote all the points down. And he was being careful. And he had his divisions in his discussion to hold his attention to the thought. And he wasn't talking about cement stucco on the job. You see what I'm saying? And he wasn't talking about Jumping out of airplane. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to fill in that space with the kind of stuff that we hear when you get up and hear a message that is not well ordered, not well prepared, and not prayed over, and everybody goes away confused. You say, wow, how does God bless? Well, somehow he still blesses, but I think about how much more he could bless. You see, when Jesus fed the 5,000, everybody got help. But when he was nailed to the cross, he helped one person. Couldn't even get the other one to. But in spite of the opposition, in spite of the torment, in spite of the confusion, God is still all-powerful. And I like to, do you have a Job life? Remember the message Wednesday night? Anybody remember that? You know how you remember that? Because it was well-ordered, it was in place, and it left you coming away with Man, I ain't nothing like Job. <laughs> and uh, that's what it was geared to do. Look at your life. Straighten your life out, man. And, the, and he, give, he, he don't need to be hanging there. He gave you the end result. God. That's it. You think, wow. <laughs> All right. Divisions. Divisions make plain. I'm on the second page. Make plain the logical process of the preacher's train of thought. The speaker's plan is perceived and his progressive argument appreciated as he proceeds from point to point. Uh, and that's very important. And, and I'm, not, I'm not saying be robotic. I'm not saying these are just the tools of the trade. And to be, I just wondered how it worked. That's how it works. And then as you practice preaching, teaching, You'll get better at what you do, and you will develop, a, and here it is, a homiletical mind. You will see things homiletically if you're a teacher or a preacher. You, you need to develop that system. A lot of preachers, they get thrown out there. They've never been schooled, never been taught. They didn't get trained in it, didn't seek any training in it, and, and they just get up and let her fly. And that's about what it sounds like. Say, can God bless that? He can. And he will. But that's not the way to do it. And a lot of times that preacher will confess, man, I'm a mess. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm at. I got off track tonight. And if they keep their heart right and they're humble, I think they get away with a lot of stuff that maybe, but boy, when they get full of themselves, and a preacher can pretty easy, uh, you're in trouble. Number three, they help the memory. When you have order to something, uh, remember when we first had the classes I talked about memorizing memory and how that one of the simple ways to memorize things is to peg things. And you might say, well, I've got to get potatoes at the store. My little finger's potatoes. I've got to get hamburger. That's my ring finger. I've got to get milk. That's my middle finger. Then my index finger. I don't know. I'll get bread. You put them on, you pegged them on those fingers. Say, what is that? That's divisions. That's how the mind works. So if I give you points, you remember. That's why we're able to recall Brother Jeremiah's message. I can't recall all the points. I'd have to go look it back up, but I'm a little fuzzy tonight. 
But I do remember the theme and the subject and where the text was in the book of Job, chapter 1. And I remember he, he read the first five verses. He had a short, and I'm using him a little bit tonight. He, he had a short text. You say, how did he learn that? Well, he's working on his master's degree in Bible, wherever Slidell, I guess, you're still working on that. So he's been through all this. I don't know what he's doing sitting here tonight. I told him he may have to pick up where I, if I fall over, you drag me out, take over. So. so they help our memory. God is a God of order and not of confusion. Remember that. And he has made men's minds orderly. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And I wanted to look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, and I haven't given you a lot of verses tonight, but that's in your syllabus. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and just verse 33, and then, then I'll have you jump down to verse, uh, I think I'm in 15. 14, 33, watch this. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So there's, God expects order. In your sermon, in your teaching, in your lesson, what you're doing in your service, there has to be order. Jump down there and look at verse 40 in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let all things be done decently and in order. And when a guy gets up to speak, teach, preach, and doesn't have any order to what he's saying, I know he's ill-prepared. He's either ignorant and doesn't know, and I pray, God help him get through this, or he doesn't care or he doesn't study, and he doesn't pray. Because he would find the same verses we're finding tonight. Um, when I first started to preach, I had no idea what I was doing. And if it hadn't have been for a pastor to take me under his wing and say, hey, we got institute, get in the institute, you'll learn something. And then another preacher there in the church took me under his wing so let me show you how to put a message together. And he come over to my house and he sat down and he took a Bible and he shared with me the very things I'm sharing with you tonight. Same stuff out of the same book. He didn't tell me that. I found that out later. So to this day, um, I have learned how to put a message together and how to present a message. Here in this lesson, number one, these divisions, they help the memory. And I give you the verses. Order transform, now i got a quote here, I like this by Gibbs. Order transforms a mob into an army, and God is a God of order. Order is heaven's first law. Uh, I preached a message here and many other places, and I entitled it, uh, Order in the House. And I start that thing in the throne room of God. Take my text out of Revelations where everything's going up, everything has an order. And they're flying through saying, holy, holy, holy. And then I go back and I talk about the, in my theme, I break it down four ways. There are four houses mentioned in the word of God. And I lay that thing out. And the first being the very throne of God. And I hold their attention because they want to know what's the next house, what's the next house. I talk about the home, that's a house. I talk about the church house, that's a house. And then I talk about your temple, that's a house. And I lay that out and give you all the scripture. And I talk about order in the house. And I conclude that thing. And that message has order. That's how a message comes. How would you get that? Well, you get it from uh, studying uh, message design or like we're doing tonight and then as you work on things and you develop you get better at what you do there will probably be a New Year's Eve service I'm probably being presumptuous here and on the New Year's Eve service don't they ask for the preachers and anybody that wants to preach to put something together and that'll probably that's not too far away guys gals I don't think you're going to get a shot at this but guys, that's when you might get to put your first message together. It'll be a 10-minute message. So you need abbreviated text. You need a quick introduction. You need three points and a conclusion. And you put your divisions down. And however many divisions you have, divide 10 minutes by those points and you'll know how long you can spend on each point. You say, what is that? That's order. So if you get all carried away giving your introduction, the people aren't going to get the message because you're going to be out there, yeah, I was catching fish down in the Bahamas, and man, I'm going to get to the message in a minute. But you're still telling stories. 
we ain't got that kind of time and you ain't going to be that good. <laughs> Say, how do you know all this? Been there and done it. <laughs> Been, somebody told me one time, I'm telling on myself, excuse me. I was probably, how old are you, son? 41, 41 years ago, he is just born. 1977, I surrendered preaching. 1976, I'd been preaching for a whole year. And I went to Texas to help Jack Grigsby start a church. We had a radio studio that we were building, WKJV Radio, Alamo, Texas. Doc Horton owned the building. Jack told me on the phone, he wasn't there yet, start the church, just start having services. Preach Sunday morning, preach Sunday night. So Doc was a soul winner, Cape Canaveral guy. I'm telling stories now, be careful. Doc went and got everybody in the church, and I got in the church, and I preached my first message in that church. I was shaking hands with people. I was so proud of myself. I got through that. That one lady looked at me and said, you ain't ever going to be a preacher. That's the worst message I've ever heard. I won't be back. <laughs> Man, you talk about messing with you. And she left. Bonnie, do you remember that? Yeah. Remember three weeks later she was back? She was in a wheelchair. She broke her leg. You say, you're kidding. No. Did you, did you do it? No. It just, it just happened. And guess what? She apologized. She said, I know you're just starting. I was a little hard on you. A little hard on me. My mother ain't that hard on me. You know. So when you first start, you're no good. I've never thought I was any good. I'm not good today. I enjoy it, and I've, I've applied these principles. That's why I think they're so important. But if you apply these principles, and then God will stir up a gift, that gift we talked about in the first lessons, and challenge you. It's untelling what God might do with you. I mean, hey, three points in a poem, guys. All right, let me just finish this up. Um, order, we, we give you that quote by Gibbs. I really like that. But look at room and number, number four. Some rules governing the form of these divisions. One, each division should be clear and distinct from the other division. And let me use uh, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, those divisions in that verse, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. They're distinctly different, but they all uh, speak to the theme that Jesus is absolutely who he said he was. Um. Uh, so each division should be clear and distinct from the other divisions. The sermon plan must precede three essential qualifications. Order, we've been talking about that, movement, and progress. You need to move through it. I'm trying to move through this. And make some progress with what you're doing. It's got to make sense at the end. Um, and now, now I've, I've, I like this quote. That's why it's there under uh, number two. A merry-go-round has movement, but no progress. Now think about that. It's not going anywhere. Its only effect is to produce giddiness, and this most emphatically is what a sermon should not produce on an audience. That would be simple entertainment for gratification. No spiritual enlightenment, no illumination, no spiritual help. A company of soldiers engaged in making time. You know what making time is? They said, mark time, whoo, and we just stand there and go like this. <laughs> and we don't go anywhere. We're marking time. It says here, a soldier engaged in marking time certainly exhibits order and movement, but there is no progress. Good illustrations for a sermon. You've got to watch. It's one thing to learn the mechanics of the message and how to do it. It's another thing to go someplace with it. Watch. Um, some sermons are of this type. The preacher used plenty of words and manifested a certain amount of movement, but to use the language of the man in the street, he got nowhere fast. That sums up a lot of preaching today. Guy's getting up there. He read a text. He, he bloviated 
but I don't know what he said. Uh, a rabble mob has both movement and progress, but possession p p possesses no order. It moves as a fancy dictates, surging here and there, but with no coherence, producing only confusion and very often damage to valuable property. An army on the march possesses all the three essentials of a good sermon, for it has order, movement, and progress. That's how a sermon needs to fluidly come across. That's why we're, we're dissecting it tonight. Number three, they should be cumulative. That is, they should gather volume, strength, and value as they proceed and also possess unity of thought. Uh, there should be a crescendo to, to the message like in a song. There's a crescendo, and they bring you to a peak, then they let you down. A good songwriter composes about the same way we put a message together. A singer won't sing a song. Well, some singer. That's not composed well or put together well or has good words. Because first thing he's going to say is, the words ain't no good. You've seen them words for. That, I'm, not, I'm telling you, that's how bad it is out in Christendom. So preaching is along the same lines. They should... Um, number four, they should seek to fully comprehend the text and theme and attempt to expound all the truth contained therein. I call that most likely expository preaching. And we want to cover the different types. We'll, we'll dedicate a little time to that probably in the next class. These divisions should be natural. They should not be too many in number. And that's a very good point. You don't want, I've got 29 points. You'll hear us, kid, you know, or... Brian McBride said, I've got three points tonight, but seven subpoints under each point. Well, it's really a joke because he understands how to put a message together and the order of the thing and how long it should take. And he's already done the math. He knows how long he's going to preach. And you can set your clock by what he's doing as a 40-minute preacher, 30-minute preacher, and that's it. So these divisions should be natural. They should not be too many in number. They should be orderly. Four things should be observed. Number one, the negative should precede the positive. In other words, if you've got... Uh, something to say and you say you might want to talk about you sure don't want to go to hell that'd be the negative side of things everybody's going to hell I did that this morning did anybody notice I put the negative first and the positive second and that's order that's how the Lord works and then the positive was heaven you don't have to go to hell you're going to, you want to go to heaven. So that's kind of a crude illustration of what's going on there. So the negative should precede the positive. We should first state what a thing is not before we describe what it really is. Now, heaven, people say, I've got a little heaven on earth. I can tell you earth is not heaven. Tell them what it's not. Now, I can tell you what heaven is. Take your Bible and turn to Revelation chapter 21, and we read about the pearly gates and all that stuff and we describe that and then you go back and say you ain't never seen that in your home and then you go on but the negative or you know the negative I want you to catch a hold of that the number two the abstract should be stated before the concrete that's a good thought that's just that's just a rule for orating watch conviction must always go before the appeal that's like in a court of law. The false must precede the truth, and it, it does. First show the wrong idea, then state the truth. Roman number number five, three methods of stating these divisions. Here we go. Number one, logical form. That means you take a logical approach to what you're trying to say. That's self-explanatory. Secondly, the rhetorical form or a lot of rhetoric, a lot of wordiness, Spurgeon was a, if you read any of his, lang his, his messages, they're very wordy, very long. He was good with words. Uh, I'm not, Paul did not orate this way. He was a man of simple speech and simple words. Uh, this is a series of phrases, or a rhetorical series of phrases that states the divisions in the rhetorical form. Then lastly, there's the interrogative form, or it's like a question form uh, 
Why wouldn't you be saved today? First point. Second point. Why would you go to hell? You know, it's in, a, it's in a question form. It's almost like a lawyer presenting his case and then the negative first, then the positive. Why wouldn't anybody in their right mind want to go to heaven? Then you turn the thing to the positive side of things. You say, what is that? That's an order. And uh, it's how it's done. It's the mechanics. Um, do, do you always fall? No. When a guy gets up to speak, if he's been trained in these ways, he knows all this and he puts that thing in order. And I showed you the message last week, a bunch of messages I just went through really quick, showing you that I do the same thing and it's very redundant. Once you develop a homiletical mind, it'll be redundant. You'll have a text, you'll get a thought, you'll get a theme, you'll write it down and say, I'm going to work on that thing. You'll get three or four points or you'll hear somebody preach something, get an idea, somebody teach something, say, man, I need to put that together. And that's how a preacher or teacher works. Okay, let's, let's finish it up. These methods, uh, number seven, I'm sorry, number six, I think I only had six points tonight. Uh, mode of discussion, the explanatory, the observational, the elements of a satisfactory sermon. And here, here number one, I've got uh, proposition, explanation, observation, illustrations. Uh, those are the things that make it work. Somebody said this about an illustration. An illustration is like a window in a dark room, that which sheds light on the subject you're trying or the theme you're trying to develop. Be careful with your illustrations. If you're trying to illustrate, you might say, well, I want to paint this red. It's really going to look good. Let me illustrate this. And then you start off on some illustration. I got a can of red paint, I painted the barn red and the cow, blah, 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 blah. Be careful with that. You can get too far off. You would be better with a Bible illustration every time. Uh, Esau was born red. There's a red heifer that's going to be offered. There's plenty of illustrations on red if you're looking anyway. Be careful with illustrations, observations. I'm going backwards now. Explanation, proposition. All those things are the working of a message. So in a nutshell, lesson last week, you need a text. You need uh, an introduction. You need well, a theme. You need a text, a theme, an introduction. Then you need the discussion. And then you need the end of the thing, which is the conclusion. And I always kind of want to end and, and I'm careful with this, on a positive note. Everything's not always positive, but if you can, for the hearer's sake, if God will allow you, end on a positive note. Most every speaker does this. Now, get to listening. If, if you watch any news, anything at all, listen to these guys give these speeches. Listen to these guys that have something to say or a lecture somewhere. You'll find they're practicing the same rules we're talking about here tonight. You say, what is it? It's just how to put together a message. Now, in our case, God has to get in it. He's a God of order, so on and so forth. Okay, I'm going to stop with that. That's the lesson for tonight. I appreciate you uttering a prayer for me. I feel uh, better, probably because I'm quitting. Is it that late? My goodness, did I? Sorry, guys. Okay, so you know what's going on. No more need for rhetoric. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for words to teach. And I ask God now, bless each person here. Go with us through our week and help us be diligent servants of thee. Help us to enjoy what you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Good evening.